Hi, I hope you are doing well. Today's lab is the molar mass of a vapor. Now, how are we going to find the molar mass of a vapor? How are we going to make measurements in the lab that will allow us to calculate the molar mass? That's what it's all about for this video. Well, in order to start understanding how we can do this, we need to introduce, I need to introduce, the ideal gas equation of state. And that's the principle, or that's the uh, underlying theory that allows us to do this. So, let's get right to it. This is what the ideal gas equation of state is. I just give it pressure. That's what the P stands for, times volume, that's what the V stands for, is equal to N times uh, R times T. All right? Now the N stands for, you'll probably never guess it, moles, because moles starts with the letter N, right? Moles. No, it doesn't. I have no idea where uh, or why everyone uses a little n to stand for moles. But anyhow, uh, that's what it stands for, moles of the gas. Now, T, of course, stands for temperature. Now, all of these properties, the pressure, the volume, the moles, and the temperature, uh, they are simple physical properties of uh, in this case, gases, that we can measure in the lab. Well, you might not be able to directly measure the moles, and we're going to come back to that in a second. So, R is called the ideal gas constant. That is something that is the result of a lot of experimental measurements, all agreeing. It's called an empirical result. And when they graphed out these results, they found this proportionality constant, we would give it a symbol of the R, called the ideal gas constant. Okay. Now, well, uh, let's see. If we can't measure moles, what can we measure? Well, we can measure mass in the lab very easily. So a simple, uh, of course, principle of math is that if you do something to one side of an equation, an equality, you can do the exact same thing to the other side of the equality, and the equality remains true. So... All that I'm going to do then is multiply both sides of this equation by a G. And what does the G stand for? No, not gas. It stands for grams. That's a convenient unit to measure in the labs, right? Grams. So if I multiply this side times the mass of the gas, that's what the G is, the grams of the gas, then I'm going to multiply the other side times the mass of the gas. That's what the G is. So because I multiply both sides times the same thing, the equation is still true. Simple mathematical rule. Now, that's great. Well, how does that help us any? Well, if you then take and divide out on this side by the substance, or the thing that we can't measure, the moles, we can't count uh, the molecules and say, well, this is how many moles we got based on the number of molecules in Avogadro's number. Um, and, you know, we're trying to find the molecular weight. In the, all the previous material, if you dealt with moles, you would uh, relate it to molecular weight that you could find or trace back to the periodic table directly, which is, of course, other people's work. What we want to do in this lab is actually use our own work to calculate a molecular weight and not just look it up through uh, atoms, atomic weights, and adding up all the atomic weights in a formula to get the molecular weight. We're trying to calculate it from our own direct experimental measurements. That's the big goal. So, like I said, I'm going to divide out the N because we can't measure that in the lab. Not directly, at least, by our any methods we have. And then if I divide by N on one side, I have to divide by N on the other side. Okay, well, what does that do for us? Well, that cancels out the N on this side. You know, you divide by this, and that, that cancels. And then um, it leaves us with this equation. R, T, G, or um, to get it, start to get it in the form of, uh, you know, the equation is given on 
your lab sheet here, that's kind of where I'm heading. That's exactly where I'm heading. Um, we could put the G in front. It doesn't matter really which side it's on. So I'm going to put the G right there. Okay. And what do I got on this other side? Well, I got G over N times PV. So let's write it like this. G over N times PV. Okay, well, guess what we need to do now? What is G over N? That's grams over moles. Grams per mole. Grams per mole is the definition of molecular weight. We're only talking about one substance here, a pure gas. So if we got grams of that pure gas over moles of that pure gas, that by definition is the molecular weight of the gas. So I'm going to put in place of that, I'm going to say that is equal to a script M, molecular weight, times P times V is equal to G R T. Well, that's getting pretty darn close to the equation given in uh, the lab sheets. All you need to do next to get that equation is divide both sides times pressure and volume. That cancels it on this side. And uh, over here, it turns into this equation right there. So, that's the equation. Let's write it one more time. Right here. That's the equation that is in your lab sheet at the top. Molecular weight, that's my big capital M here. In the uh, lab sheet, it just says molar mass. Same thing. Uh, is equal to grams of the gas that we can uh, measure. That's the, one of the big aspects of the experiment is it's a nifty little tricky way to actually measure the mass of a gas. And we'll get to that in just a minute or two. So then it's times R. That's the ideal gas constant, which is um, known and will be given. I'll write it up here, the values that we'll use in just a minute, times T, temperature. Well, that's easy to measure. And I'll mention a couple other things about this in just a minute as well. Times pressure over volume. That's the equation that's in uh, your lab sheet. And that's a very valuable equation because that means if you can just measure these properties of the gas, and you know what R is, a constant already, you can get the molar mass of any gas. That's pretty remarkable. Okay, so that's uh, uh, showing where this comes from, but, you know, where did the ideal gas equation come from in the first place? The ideal gas equation is most commonly given in this form right here, that we started with. PV is equal to NRT. That's the ideal gas equation state in its most common elementary form. And, again, this equation is called an equation of state because it tells you the state of the gas. This equation is a simple result in the world of physical sciences. This is a very simple equation. And guess what? It gives very good results with common everyday systems that you experience around you under reasonably normal conditions. So that, what did that tell you? Why This also brings up the idea of the ideal gas. The ideal. What's ideal about it? Well, this is, again, this is an equation for one gas, okay? If you take and rearrange this equation right here, I'm going to show you, I'm going to, this will emphasize the idea of it being ideal, simplified, overly simplified. Then it, you, I'm just going to write it like this, R, if you divide both sides by NT, you'll end up getting R is equal to PV over NT. Pressure times volume divided by moles divided by temperature. That's what R is equal to. And it's a constant. It is a constant. That's constant. And what value uh, are we going to uh, use our, for the lab? Well, I mean, the value depends on the units that you have. And this right here can tell you the units, the order of the units. Okay? So the value of the ideal gas constant, the most uh, easy value for us to use is 0 0.08206 and that's four significant figures. Okay, now what are the units going to be? Well, um, this is a certain number. It's this number because we have certain units that we use for pressure, volume, and temperature. And N is always the moles. So what units do we have to use for the pressure in order to have this 
the numerical value here, we have to use the units of atmospheres. ATM, atmospheres. Okay? And what unit do we need to use for volume? If we're going to have this numerical value there, then the unit needs to be liters. That's a convenient unit to measure in the lab, liters. And what unit? Well, N is uh, defined as moles. And T, any time that you're working with temperature in an ideal gas problem uh, in, in your book, in your, for your lab, on a test, uh, if you're doing anything with ideal gas uh, equations, or equations of state for that matter, you have to use units of Kelvin for the temperature. Okay? Absolute temperature units of Kelvin. That's what it depends on uh, for uh, the equations to be legitimate. All right. If you have any questions on this, please do email me. Don't hesitate to email me. All right. Um, now, that is the numerical value of the ideal gas constant when we have these units. If you change units, like for instance, let's say I do a different pressure unit, such as um, pascals, or kilopascals, or a different volume unit, such as cubic meters, uh, then this number, the numerical value here can change, but it's still talking about the exact same thing. It's like saying, okay, I'm going to measure the length of uh, this marker. Well, if you measure it in inches, it'll have one numerical value. If you measure it in centimeters, you'll have a different numerical value, right? <coughs> so, obviously the length of the marker didn't change, just the units changed, and the corresponding number that has to go with it. That's what we have here. If you look at uh, ideal gas constant uh, numbers, they can change, and the units will change accordingly. But it's still talking about the same thing. What is it talking about? Well, <laughs> that's the physical uh, prediction that if you measure the pressure of a gas, you measure the volume of that gas, and you know it's in a in a container under a constant condition, and you figure out the bowls of, of gas that you have in there, and you measure the temperature, and you put it into this equation, pressure and volume over NT, you will always get this numerical result right there. <laughs> no matter what kind of gas it is. It could be hydrogen gas, helium gas, chlorine gas, mustard gas, um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, any gas. Doesn't matter. That's the idealized part of the ideal gas equation. Uh, it says all gases are the same. And they will all give you this result. And of course, it's not quite true. It's not true, but near normal conditions like we experience every day, it is quite accurate to uh, three or four significant figures in many cases. If you have uh, the gas around room temperature, normal pressures, you know, you can fluctuate some and it's still accurate. Okay, well that's pretty remarkable. That is why it's ideal. It's a simple equation that gives you dependable results that are accurate and you can measure. That's also what we're going to be confirming with this equation right there. When we measure these values, plug in this for R, this constant, we can get the accurate molecular weight of the gas to uh, two or three significant figures. You know, and then we'll have some experimental error that will come in there that will throw us off a few percentages. And again, if there are any questions, email me, please. Or leave comments in the comment section. Get a little conversation going. That's great, too, in the comments section for this video. Okay, what's next? I want to come back to this idea of pressure and give you some, uh, try to give you some intuitive feeling for pressure and what it is uh, whenever you hear it. So pressure, um, uh, everyday normal pressure, could be one atmosphere of pressure. One atmosphere of pressure is what you're used to experiencing all the time near sea level. How much pressure is that? That's where I want to get 
the intuitive idea going a little bit for you. Uh, I say the intuitive idea going for you a little bit. Um, it's actually not intuitive, funny enough. Um, because we, you're, we are used to it, we experience it, uh, you know, on our skin, on our body, all the time. Uh, we take it for granted. We don't really understand how much pressure that is. It's just what we deal with all the time. But let's uh, get a hold of that a little bit. I'm going to come back to the more fundamental definition of pressure. Okay, pressure is, and this is right at the beginning of the chapter in the book, um, defined as force per unit area. That's the simple definition of pressure. It's a force, which is a push, applied over a certain area. Okay, and you could say it's a weight applied over a certain area, because weight is force due to gravity, right? Now, um, well, how much is one atmosphere? Let's put it in a different unit. Whenever I think of pressure, and, and I think of what you probably have experience with in your everyday life, I think car tire pressure, or, you know, pressure on your bicycle tire. That's pretty common experience for almost everybody in our um, day and age. So what is the common car tire pressure? And what are the units on it? That's what I wanted to mainly get to. A common car tire pressure somewhere around 35 PSI. That's the unit, PSI. What does PSI stand for? Pounds per square inch. The force would be pounds, like I said, a weight, and the area is a square inch. Pounds per square inch. That's a common pressure unit that you deal with or may deal with on a regular basis. So how much is one atmosphere of pressure if you put it in pounds per square inch? I believe it's 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch. Let me write it as LB, pounds per inch squared. That's the uh, equivalent of one atmosphere. Now the reason that I went to these units is because it gives us something very concrete to work with. What if we wanted to figure out the force? Then all you need to do, uh, rearrange this equation and say the force is then going to be equal to pressure times area. That's right, just, you know, multiply both sides by A. So that is what is, allows us to see a pretty interesting thing about how much force we have on our bodies at all times, just from air pressure. Okay, let's plug it in. Okay, the force is equal to the pressure. Well, if it's normal atmospheric pressure, everyday pressure, it's 14.7 pounds per square inch. Right. Well, what area was I talking about? Uh, the area of a standard sheet of paper. 8 by 11. Okay, that's 8 inches by 11 inches. That's 88 square inches. So, we're taking pressure times area. 14.7 times 88 square inches. What does that equal? Let me get my calculator. Aha! So, 14.7 times 88, 1,290. Okay. 1,290 what? Well, 1,200 inches squared cancels. 1,290 pounds. 1,290 pounds. What does that mean? That's how much force is pushing on the front of this piece of paper. 1,290 pounds. If that's much force is pushing on the front of this paper, why ain't I smashed against the board? This thing's just crushing me. You know, what, what's the deal? What's going on here? Well, take a second. Obviously, pressure doesn't just push on the front of the paper, the force from the atmosphere pressure also pushes on the back of the paper. 
an equal amount, front and back equal amount of force exerted on it, so the paper is in equilibrium with respect to the air pressure. And that is why we don't experience it as a force in one direction or the other, unless the wind blows. The wind, of course, is when there's a pressure difference between different areas of the air, and then the wind will blow. Then we experience it. Other than that, though, this paper is just uh, light as can be, obviously, because it's only got gravity causing it uh, to have any net directional force, which is, of course, downwards. And that's no problemo. But this much force is pushing on both sides. So imagine the surface area of our entire body. Every single square inch of us has 14.7 pounds pushing on it. The entire surface area of our body is much greater than a sheet of paper, obviously. And so if you were to um, add up the entire force exerted on our entire body from the atmospheric pressure, it's going to be thousands of pounds. And we just take it for granted all the time. We think nothing of it. Isn't that funny? Now, one other bit, uh, point on this to demonstrate, you know, if you ever watch movies, I'm sure you watch movies, well, you watch a movie right now, uh, in many movies, uh, I mean, multiple movies, people go to space and catastrophes happen. Their space suit breaks. Uh, well, in some of these movies, they show some things that happen to you people if they were in space with their space suit broken. All the air gets, uh, you know, sucked out of their suit. And what happens to their body? Well, the blood starts getting sucked out of their eyeballs. And it starts into just, a, you know, a horrible death. Because th their body is basically exploding. Why would you explode? If you go to space and you don't have any pressurized suit, you will explode. Because this force is not pushing all over your surface of your body, which your body is designed to live under that pressure at all times. And so if it's suddenly taken away, you're going to explode. And that's that. This happens to deep sea fish. If you ever uh, have heard of uh, uh, deep sea diving, then you know that divers have to be very cautious of this because they have high, high pressure down deep and then they come up and they get the bends is what it's called. Bubbles start, you know, uh, forming in their blood as the pressure changes, okay? So, the deep sea fish, if you catch one and you pull it up to the surface, that's toast, it's dead, because it's, uh, it's going to basically explode. It's built to live at high pressures, and when you go to low pressures, it's in trouble. Okay, and so that's demonstrating the idea of how much pressure we take for granted all the time. Now, when you say your car tire pressure is 35 PSI, that means 35 pounds per square inch above regular pressure that is all around us. If your car tire pressure is equal to the outside pressure, guess what that means? A flat tire. And so we have to have extra pressure in that car tire over and above the outside pressure. So that's what 35 PSI is. That's called the gauge pressure. That's over and above the regular atmospheric pressure. And you can see, you know, compared to this, that's a little over double our everyday pressure is what the car tire pressure uses. All right, if there's any questions on this, again, please email me. Well, there's one other unit that I can introduce here um, to talk about how uh, we're going to measure pressure. That's called um, the, the TOR. So one atmosphere is equal to 760 torr. All right, that's another unit of pressure. And that comes from the name of an um, Italian man, Torricelli. Uh, Torricelli uh, invented the barometer. And the barometer is what we are going to use to measure the pressure in our lab. And uh, plug it in for this equation here, okay? 760 torr. And another way of writing uh, that unit for all practical purposes is identical to 760 millimeters of mercury. 
that's another unit of pressure. Like I said, there's multiple units of pressure that are pretty commonly used and you should become familiar with. So, 760 millimeters of mercury. What is that talking about? Millimeters of mercury. Well, that comes from the barometer. Let me uh, demonstrate what a barometer is real quick. Um, but, before I do that, let me give you a quick lab demo. Uh, it might be pretty instructive. All right, are you ready for this? I don't know, it's pretty impressive. I have this little laminated square here that I cut, you know, plastic laminated, it's nothing special, but uh, you might have thought it was something special, so I'm not gonna use it. Um, instead, instead I'm going to use a oh, cardboard box. I'm gonna rip off a piece of this cardboard box here, just so you know that it's nothing special. Of course, it's got a very smooth surface, and in fact, I ripped it a little bit right there in the middle. And I need that square. Maybe that's big enough. Big enough for this one. That one back there. Yeah, looks like it's big enough for that one. All right, so it's nothing special. It is just a messy little piece of cardboard. What am I doing? Well, this is a thousand milliliter flask. <clears throat> I'm going to fill it with water. Try not to be too impressed here. Now, what do you think is going to happen to all this water if I invert the flask? What do you think is going to happen? Well, obviously, the water is just going to dump out. Oh, man. That sure did. Well, what's the point? <laughs> I'm going to fill it again. I filled it all the way up. It doesn't have to be filled all the way up, but uh, it might help a little bit. I don't know. Piece of cardboard. And this is going to be scary. Oh, I'm going to put a little trash can under here. Trash can right there just to catch a little bit of water. This is it. Smooth surface. Put that on there. I'm going to claim that it's not going to dump out when I invert this flask. Are you ready? Pretty close. Here we go. I'm just gonna hold my one little finger on it. Boop. What's happening? Oh! Look at that! It's not spilling. Oh, I'm gonna move over here. Not spilling. Not spilling. Why am I moving in here? Because when you see something, wait. Let me do this. Up close. This will be up close. Are you ready? Let's do this again. I'm going to hold it over the sink now. All right. There it is again. You think that's something special? You think there's some glue there? Nope, nope, nope. No glue or nothing. What's going to happen? Ding. Now. This is no glue. I just barely touched it. And down it crashes. Pretty cool, huh? Now my paper is pretty wet, so I don't know if it's going to work as good. Now, you thought that was impressive? Check this jumbo guy out. Two big liters. Filling this one up. It's even more water. No way can a piece of paper hold that much water in this big old jug. Even if it's soaking wet. I don't know if it's going to work if it's soaking wet. It's working! Woohoo! You ready? Barely touch it. What's gonna happen? Boom! Why? Why? Why does that work? How could it hold that water up there? It's amazing! Alright, here's the, def the reason. In case you were wondering. Let's see if I can explain this real easily. So, when I put the card on there, and... I flip it over, the card is blocking the outside air from getting into the flask. Okay?
Um, as long as the outside air can't get in there, then it just pushes in one direction, holds that weight of that water up, no problem. But as soon as the outside air pressure gets in there, then the weight of the water is greater than, of course, the uh, pressure holding the paper up. Uh, the pressure inside is going to have the outside air because the air was getting in there and the weight of the water, so it's going to, you know, push everything down and out, and, and that's the end of the uh, amazing demonstration. One other little detail is worth mentioning here. What about the weight of the paper, right? If it's in equilibrium whenever I'm uh, holding it and I take my finger off and it's just the paper is, is stuck there and everything's in equilibrium. How come the weight of this little piece of paper doesn't just fall down? What's stopping that? Well, that's adhesion forces between the water in there and the paper. The adhesion forces actually are sufficient to hold the piece of paper uh, in place and counter the weight of the paper, if you will. Now that's the uh, part that you have to make sure you get right if you want to do this demonstration yourself because you got to have a light enough piece of paper that the adhesion forces from the water can actually hold it in place and counter the weight of that paper and not allow any water, I mean sorry, any outside air to get in. That just demonstrated the principle behind the working of a barometer, okay? A barometer has mercury in it, not water. That's where the idea of millimeters of mercury comes from. Uh, mercury is much more dense than water. I think it's like 13 times more dense than water. It's liquid metal, of course, so extremely heavy uh, per unit. Now, that means that a column of mercury can be much shorter than a column of water. Remember, I took the uh, 1,000 milliliter flask and inverted it, and the outside atmospheric pressure held that 1,000 milliliters of water up that height, no problem. And then I did it with a 2,000 milliliter flask, and the outside pressure held that, the force, you say the force caused by the outside pressure, or due to the outside pressure, held that 2 liter uh, which was taller, a two liter column. No problem. Well, how high could a column of water get and still be held by the outside pressure? If you did some, a uh, little bit of, you know, checking around and, and you'd find that it can hold around 33 feet of water, straight up. So I could have a flask 33 feet tall and I could put a little bitty card on there and the outside pressure could hold it as long as no air got inside the flask, you know, around the edges to cause the pressure to, you know, equal uh, and then the weight of the water to crash out. As long as that doesn't happen, it can hold around 33 feet, I believe. You can double check me on that. Well, who can walk around with a 33 foot tall barometer? Not going to be practical. So what do we got? Mercury. Instead of water, we use a column of mercury. And that happens to be normal atmospheric pressure. Column of mercury can be 760 millimeters. That's obviously 76 centimeters. And you can do a conversion to see how many inches it is. And I'm going to show you one in the lab in just a few minutes. Uh, let me draw it out real quick. It's a very simple idea. Now, you have a column and, uh, and it's open at the bottom sealed at the top. Let me uh, make it a little bit taller. Doesn't really matter, but you know, it's, it's fairly decent length. And so, uh, rather than having a little piece of paper down here to um, you know, hold the outside air away, or at, you know, from keeping it from getting inside, um, you know, we have another uh, little container right there. And this little container is also filled with a liquid. Okay, now what does that do? Well, if there's a liquid on the outside and this is open, so this is open to the outside, and there's liquid right on the inside of that, 
So rather than having a piece of paper seal off the end of this tube, it's just a, a liquid sealing off the end of the tube. And this liquid has, of course, the outside pressure hitting it. And that uh, uh, is translated right there. And uh, whatever is inside this is experiencing, you know, the pressure from the outside right there. And when you have that situation, if there's a sealed container so that no air can get up inside, then you can have a certain height above the surface. Let's say it's right there. This height of liquid inside this column, mercury, is 760 millimeters. 760 or 76.0 centimeters. That's how high air, the force caused by air pressure, can push a column of mercury. Now what's right here is a vacuum. Okay? There's nothing right here. It's, it, this, this was filled with mercury completely, and then you put the end of it into uh, another pool of mercury, and then you invert it. And if this column is tall enough, so, you know, it's got to be a little bit taller than 760 millimeters, then the mercury will fall down. And when the mercury falls down, it'll continue to fall until the weight of this mercury that is pushing down equals the outside atmosphere pressure. It's like saying, okay, that's, that's what's pushing up right there, is the outside atmosphere. And the weight of the mercury is pushing down, and right here, vacuum is doing nothing. Vacuum can't do anything. It is nothing. How can nothing do something? That's a metaphysical, well, not metaphys that's a physics question. It is way beyond the scope of our class. So a vacuum does nothing, but the outside air pressure can hold this mercury up to 760 mil unless it changes. And that's what the barometer is used for. If it pressure decreases on the outside, then, then it can't hold up as much mercury and it will fall. Mercury will fall. If the outside pressure increases, then the mercury will rise. Okay? That's the basic idea of a barometer. And Torricelli invented this, and he discovered, he credited with basically discovering pressure, air pressure. And it's dependence on altitude, because he would be at the bottom of the valley with his barometer, and he would see that the uh, mercury was at a certain level. And then he would climb to the top of the mountain and set up his barometer and see that the mercury would fall. And he says, well, the only thing that's changed is my altitude. And it would fall because there's less pressure at the top of the mountain. You go high, high, high up in the sky, you're going to get low, low pressure because there's less atmosphere above you pushing down. Just exactly the same as when you're in the shallow end, you don't experience as much pressure as if you go in the deep end of the pool down to the bottom, right? So that's the same with the atmosphere. And Torricelli is the one that discovered that. And that is more than enough for the background theory and whatever else about this lab. We need to go and do the lab. Okay, before we get to the experiment, I just wanted to mention a couple of details real quick on the pre-lab study quiz here. Um, on question number three in particular, that's where you're going to have to use the equation at the top of molar mass. So... The uh, question has 256 milliliters uh, for the flask volume, and the temperature is in Kelvin, pressure is in millimeters of mercury, and the mass of the gas is given. This is the same type of data we're going to get for our experiment. What we need to do, though, is in order to plug into the molar mass equation here, is simply uh, convert milliliters of the flask into liters and millimeters of mercury, the pressure, into atmospheres. The reason for that is because the ideal gas constant, R, uh, the value that we're going to use has the units of, um, well, it's 8206 and it has units of atmospheres, liters, moles, Kelvin, right? Now, because we're using this uh, ideal gas constant with these units, we have to have the corresponding units for the rest of the values from the problem. So you've got to convert this to atmospheres and this to liters, and then plug into 
the molar mass equation up here to solve for the uh, right. so for molecular this weight of we this need to gas have and that, a and trapped problem. gas uh, in a container that we can of course have controlled conditions that can be measured so our gas is going to end up being in this flask and I'm going to have an aluminum foil lid on this. Uh, you can kind of get an idea or a preview of the setup when you look at the picture right there. That's basically what I'm doing, except for without the Bunsen burner. I'm just going to use a hot plate instead. Now, um, so once we get a gas generated inside this flask, and the way that we're uh, going to do that is to uh, boil uh, liquid and vaporize it and then it'll be trapped in the flask. Now once we have that we need to be able to know what the temperature is of the gas in here and the volume of the gas in here and the pressure of the gas in here and of course the mass of the gas in here. So that's what this lab is all about. How are we going to figure that or measure that and then use those values of course in that uh, equation. So in order to get the temperature, we're going to, or I'm going to, immerse the flask into boiling water. And then whenever the liquid vaporizes, it will sit in the boiling water for, I don't know, half a minute or so. And come to equilibrium with the boiling water in its temperature. Well, uh... In order to help ensure that that's the case, that the gas inside here is at the same temperature as the boiling water, um, I'm going to need to be able to immerse it in the water to a maximum depth. The maximum amount without overflowing. And let's just check the height. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and turn this uh, on, but I'm going to take the flask out here. But it's going to be heating up to a boil while I prepare the flask with the rest of the uh, setup, okay? So we need to put the lid on the flask, which is just going to be a aluminum foil lid. Now, um, the lid is just aluminum foil with the rubber band on it, as is shown in your um, figure here. One detail that uh, we have to watch out for is this uh, aluminum that is hanging down. When we immerse that into the water, into the boiling water, this aluminum that's hanging down will catch water up underneath it. Uh, so I want to minimize that possibility. I'm just going to uh, tear this aluminum off. Oh, dang it. Pour it too much. Okay, new aluminum foil here. Try this again. That should be good enough. Now, that's my aluminum foil lid. Now, the thing is, of course, we're going to put some liquid in here and vaporize it. Well, if we did that and this lid is airtight, which, you know, it's pretty uh, sealed with a nice tight rubber band on there, it's good possibility that the vapor that is inside the flask it will be high pressure because it's going to be um, uh, trapped and there's going to be more than enough vapor that would fit in there uh, at normal pressure. And so, you know, when you heat up uh, a canister of gas, it gets to be higher and higher pressure. You know, never throw your aerosol cans into a fireplace, right? That kind of thing. So we don't want high pressure in here. We, we wouldn't know what it was. What we do know is the pressure in the room around us. And we're going to see the barometer in just a minute and check what that is. But in order to avoid pressurizing the gas in the flask, we're going to put a tiny, tiny little hole in the aluminum foil lid. All I'm going to do is use the lid of my pencil. Okay? A super tiny hole. The tinier the better. Ding. That's it. You see that? Super, super tiny hole. Now, 
The reason it needs to be so tiny is because we want the gas to be trapped in here and we don't want air to get back in there and, you know, displace the gas. We want to have a pure gas of a known substance in here. And then we can, you know, uh, make all the measurements that we need. So, that's the lid. And now the next step is to start making some uh, measurements on your data sheet here. The top one says uh, mass of flask and foil and condensed vapor. Well, we don't know what the mass of the condensed vapor is yet because we have to go through the boiling or vaporizing process. Um, but we need to measure the mass of the flask and foil. So that's the lid here. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and measure that with everything on the scale here while it's completely empty. So let me bring you over here and take a look at that. Okay, here we go. So this scale is a pretty darn precise scale. It goes all the way to the nearest thousandth of a gram. And so that'll be, give us plenty of significant figures. Zero it out there. Put our flask on there. And it's 95.812. Okay. So it's 95.812 grams. All right, the next thing is to take the lid off of it and put some liquid in there. Uh-oh, you know what just happened? A tiny piece of aluminum foil popped off when I took the lid off. Should I remeasure the mass? May as well. Did that tiny piece of aluminum foil make any difference? 95.810. You know, that's probably outside of our range of precision for this experiment. But, oh well. We'll just keep it on there. Time to apply detail, or detail. pour the liquid into the flask. Well, all we need is some rough amount of liquid in here. We don't have to precisely measure it. Just enough to, you know, vaporize and fill the flask. Um, I'm going to start with acetone. Okay. Acetone is most commonly associated with fingernail polish remover. <clears throat> well, I just had the brilliant thought that, you know, anytime you're dealing with vaporizing substances in the lab, gases in the lab, it's a good idea to have the fume hoods on. So let me click that on there. And hopefully this won't uh, affect the uh, sound quality too much. They are a little bit noisy. Of course, they ventilate the entire lab very effectively. And if I really had some toxic gas that I um, wanted to keep out of the lab, then I would keep it underneath this fume hood. Um, but acetone is not a very toxic gas. So I'm not too worried about putting it under the fume hood for this experiment. Um, but it is nice to have some general ventilation. And the second gas that I'm going to do is uh, isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol is pretty toxic, but not toxic enough for me to be worried about it when I'm in here all by myself with one little setup. So isopropyl alcohol, of course, is what is used for rubbing alcohol, typically in a 70% solution. This is a 100% isopropyl alcohol, so it needs uh, some general ventilation. So I'm going to rinse out this little uh, flat, I mean, graduated cylinder. Now I rinsed it with water, and because acetone is so cheap, 
and it's easy to uh, just rinse it with some acetone next to get rid of the water. All right, now I'm going to measure out five milliliters of acetone to pour into the graduate cylinders to start with. All right, that should be good enough. So uh, once I put it in here, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to put it in the clamp and then immerse it in this water once it starts boiling. Down the hatch, put the lid up, back on there. Okay, now while we're waiting for this water to start boiling, let's go check the barometer. Well, the barometer is in the other lab, the organic lab, next door, so coming through this back room here. Okay, here it is, the old-fashioned mercury barometer. Um, it's probably older than me and you, mm, maybe even older than me and you combined. That's uh, pretty old. Let's take a look at it here. Um, it's a long column like I was describing in the classroom with a pool of mercury down there. And we are planning on actually getting this professionally disposed of pretty soon before we got interrupted with all this other stuff with the school having to shut down pretty much. Now, uh, in this pool, or in this container that mercury is, there's a little hole right there. It's open to the atmosphere. And this column is uh, open at the bottom and it's um, filled with mercury. You can kind of see a metal shine in there. And it's fairly so you tall. Can see from about here all the way up to um, here is 76 centimeters. 76 centimeters. So that's the height that the outside atmosphere is pushing through that little hole and pushing this mercury all the way up this glass tube. The glass tube goes all the way up to, you know, way up here and it's sealed at the top and it's just a vacuum at the top, uh, empty. And so there's nothing pulling. Vacuums don't pull, contrary to what uh, some people like to say, or most people like to say, that vacuums don't suck. It's actually the outside pressure pushing everything towards the vacuum. Okay, now the outside pressure is pushing this mercury column up to a certain height and depending on what it is, uh, we can say what the atmospheric pressure is in units of centimeters of mercury. So let's take a closer All look right, at that. Alright, this is the scale and you can see the mercury inside the glass tube right here. And there's the 76 centimeter mark, there's 75, so the smallest marks on here are tenths of a centimeter. So I would say it comes up to about 75.56 75.6 centimeters of mercury. And you can't even estimate in between the smallest marks if you want to get a fourth significant figure. I would say 75.58 75.58 centimeters of mercury. That's the pressure so in the atmosphere. pressure is 75.58 centimeters of mercury. Now remember, in order to plug into that uh, ideal gas equation to calculate molecular weight, we have to convert this to atmospheres. So you guys are going to have to do that, okay? Now, Let's see if that no, water's boiling. The water is still not boiling. That's a lot of water. It takes a while to boil. Almost boiling now. I want it up to a rapid boil. Uh, so I can be sure that everything's at 100 degrees Celsius or very, very close to it. I'm going to go grab a thermometer and double check. Almost to 100. Matter of fact, it is to 100. So that's boiling. So let's immerse the flask.
All right. It's all the way down in there. And now we just wait for the water to get back up to a boil. And wait about a minute for all the acetone to uh, vaporize. And then maybe another 30 seconds for all the vapor to come to an equilibrium temperature with the boiling water. And then we take it out and dry it off. Dry the flask off and cool it. Now if all of the liquid vaporized, there's nothing but gas inside the flask, there's no air in there, well uh, when it cools, guess what's going to happen to that vapor? It will condense onto the walls of the flask. Once the flask is cool, that vapor condenses and then the air rushes back in the flask. And so then we will remeasure it with the condensed vapor or the droplets, the condensed droplets, remeasure the mass of it and subtract off the empty mass, and that gives us the mass of the gas. That's the nifty little part of this lab that allows you to calculate the mass of the gas. Boiling, boiling, boiling. You think it's been long enough? I don't know. Not quite yet. All right, I'm going to check it. I'm just going to lift it up here and dry off the bottom of it. Let's see if all the liquid is gone. Oh, it looks like all the liquid is gone to me already. I'm going to have to dry off the bottom of it. Just make sure the outside droplets don't confuse me any. And yes, all the liquid is gone. So I'll immerse it in this water for 20 more seconds and then I will say that it is at an equilibrium temperature with the boiling water. Okay, I think that's been long enough. So now we need to let it cool. Alright. Well, I don't know why I just now drive it off so much because a quick cooling method is to put it into some cool running water. We got the water of course, running water right over here. I don't know if you can see that. That just cools the outside of it down to room temperature really quickly, so I don't have to wait all day for it to cool down and condense that vapor in there. dry the outside of it again and you see all see all that inside of there that's pure condensed vapor that is not water that somehow got back into the got into the flask it was completely clear a second ago and then I ran the water over it and all of this you know instantly condensed on into the flask now all I'm going to do to judge if it's that back down to room temperature I'm going to feel the outside of the flask some and it's not quite all back down to room temperature. So I'm going to run a little bit more water over it on the other side. That ought to be pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and take it out of the clamp here. Well, the top of it's still pretty warm. The bottom of it's pretty cool, though. Let me run a little bit more water over the closer to the top. So that ought to do it. It is pretty good room temperature. I think it's good enough. What do you think? Well, what we can do, we can see some liquid back in there now on the bottom of it. At least I can see it pretty easily. We're going to remeasure the mass of it, okay? Make sure again that I got all the water dried off of it. I don't want any water trapped up under the lid. All right, so let's measure the mass. Bing! It should be higher than what it was before because now it has the condensed vapor. 
in there. So it's 96.263. That goes up here. 96.26. Well, it went down to 260, but that might just be from the gas escaping. I don't know. That's a minor difference. I'll go ahead and put 260, though. 96.2, see it's still going down a little bit. That's probably from the gas escaping through the tiny pinhole at the top. This scale is very sensitive. So I'm going to go with 96.260. Okay, now the temperature of the water, my thermometer says it's actually at 101.0 uh, degrees Celsius. Now don't forget you need to convert that to Kelvin. Okay. In order to plug it into the equation. Now, the mass of the vapor is just going to be subtracting these two. Alright? Alright, the next thing to do is work with the isopropyl alcohol. Do the same procedure. Um, we made all the experimental measurements that we need for the acetone system, the rest of it is just calculations, um, except for one experimental measurement, the volume of the flask. And I'll measure the volume of the flask after I've done the isopropyl alcohol here. Um, I haven't ever done isopropyl alcohol before, so I'm going to be curious to see how well it works with the isopropyl alcohol to get a good molar mass. Um, so let's get to it. Probably put some more water in there. We'll have to leave it at that for the time being. Alright, it's been about a minute or two. I'm going to lift it up and check to see if all the liquid is gone on it. liquid's gone inside of it. Well, no, all the liquid isn't gone. See, isopropyl alcohol has a higher boiling point, so it's a little bit harder to boil off than, than the acetone was. Okay, it's been about another minute or two, so let's check it again. Um, nope, I don't see any liquid in there. No liquid in there, so I'm going to call that one done and go ahead and let it start cooling. We're going through the cooling process here, putting it in, running it in some cold water like we had before. Again, the top of it is still very hot, but the bottom of it is cool where I ran the water over it. So you can see all that condensed vapor inside of there. It was crystal clear when I first took it out of the water. Get that top ran the water cool down a little bit. All 
Alright, I think that's pretty cool now. Oh, it's still got a little bit of heat running around the neck of it. A little annoying. Probably not enough to make a huge difference. Well, that's definitely cool enough. Let's go ahead and get the mass of this guy. And all that outside water off of it for sure. Now this mass should be higher than the mass when it was empty when it was measured at the beginning as well. So 96.511. So you see that's higher than the mass that we started with, so that's the mass of the condensed vapor that we got to subtract to put right here. So this one is still 95.810. These are the only two trials we're going to do. Just remember this one is for acetone, and this is for isopropyl alcohol. And that's the extent of the main measurements. The only thing that's left is to get the volume of the flask. Right, to get the volume of the flask, all I'm going to do is fill it completely with water and dump it into a graduated cylinder. Now just remember that the uh, gas that was trapped in this flask filled the entire flask. This is a 250 milliliter flask, but that does not mean that the volume of this flask is precisely 250. That means that it can comfortably hold a maximum of 250 milliliters. We need to figure out precisely what this volume is, because that is what the gas did. It filled it completely. So I'm going to completely fill it with water here, all the way to the rim, and I'm going to dump it into this graduated cylinder and figure out the total volume. This is a little bit tricky to not spill it. Bring up a little pipe in. Okay. So that's 100 milliliters. some again. I know a better way to do this. The problem is just pouring it out of this flask. This thing is not very uh, suited to pouring. So I'm going to fill this up completely and pour it into a beaker. That'll work. Without spilling anything. Okay, that was a good one. Now it should be easy, much easier to pour into the graduated cylinder for measurement. Mm -hmm. Much easier. No spilling involved. That's what you call smart right there. Okay, there's 100. Plus. 100 more. And the last little bit should be, well, it might be, I don't know how close it'll be to 50. We'll find out. It's a good bit more than 50 because, like I said, that flask could comfortably hold 250. Fill it all the way to the rim, though, that's not comfortable anymore. So this comes out to be 200 plus. No, 74, 75. 275, that's three significant figures. If you really wanted me to estimate, uh, I think you estimate that tenth part, but 275, that's good enough for me. See that? No. It's got an angle here, so it's hard for y'all to see. Alright, so the temperature here was the same 101.0. 
and the volume of the flask is 270, 275 milliliters. Now remember for the ideal gas equation, we're going to need to convert that to liters before you plug it into that equation to calculate the molar mass okay, of the acetone and the molar mass of the isopropyl alcohol. Alright, so that's all the measurements. All that's left is calculations. Remember to show all your work and hope you enjoyed this video. No glue or nothing, of course. Ah!